1837, Joseph Smith made several editorial changes in the Book of Mormon, many are relatively innocuous, but one of them is much more substantial. In the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, all right, worked. And I didn't have to have you come back up. This is good. What? Yeah, it's the first time today we've got this thing going. All right. The verse we know is 1 Nephi 11, 18 read. And he said, And behold, the virgin that thou seest is the mother of God after the matter of the flesh. All right. But the 1837 edition, Joseph inserted the son of, so that the verse has read ever since, and he said unto me, Behold, the virgin whom thou seest is the mother of the Son of God, after the man of the flesh. There is no way of knowing just what was on Joseph Smith's mind when he made that change. That hasn't stopped a lot of people from trying. <laughs> However, when we focus on the fact of the change, we inherently begin to ask the wrong questions. Several authors have discussed this change as evidence of an evolving LDS theology of God. That very question implicitly supposes Joseph Smith is the author of the Book of Mormon by supposing that the Book of Mormon is evidence of Joseph's theology, or his early thought. If we believe the Book of Mormon, it isn't. The Book of Mormon doesn't represent Joseph's theology. It represents Nephite theology. To understand Nephite theology, our focus should be on explaining why the verse is there in the first place, not on what happened to it later. For the Book of Mormon, Understanding theological evolution will, in fact, be a key to our understanding of this text, but it will not be the evolution of LDS theology, it will be the evolution of Israelite theology. The Book of Mormon begins its history in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah in Jerusalem, or 597 BC. While this is our first dated event, the figures in the story are obviously alive at that time, and as the text opens, Lehi has four sons and some daughters. Lehi is clearly old enough to experience certain events that took place before 597 BC, but which were not recorded. The invasion of Jerusalem by Babylon is certainly the most obviously catalytic event for the Book of Mormon as it sets the stage for Lehi's call as a prophet and the command for his family to flee the coming destruction. However, another event may prove to have been the most lasting influence on the Book of Mormon history. Lehi lived through the time of the Deuteronomic Reform. In a forum presentation at BYU this year, Margaret Barker noted, King Josiah changed the religion of Israel in 623 BC. According to the Old Testament account in 2 Kings 23, he removed all manner of idolatrous items from the temple and purified his kingdom of Canaanite practices. Temple vessels made for Baal, Asherah, and the host of heaven were, re were removed, idolatrous priests were deposed, and the Asherah itself was taken from the temple and burned, and much more besides. An old law book had been discovered in the temple, and this had prompted the king to bring the religion of his kingdom into line with the requirements of that book. There could only be one temple, it stated, and so all other places of sacrificial worship had to be destroyed. The law book is easily recognizable as Deuteronomy, and so King Josiah's purge is usually known as the Deuteronomic Reform of the Temple. The serendipity of finding a lost book right at the beginning of a series of reforms has raised the question of the authenticity of that book. Even though the timing is still suspicious, we need not dismiss the entire work as a politically ex exigent construction. Norman Gottwald writes that in, in his introduction to Deuteronomy for the Interpreter's One Volume Commentary on the Bible, the one hard date is the year of Josiah's reform, 622. It's kind of interesting that his hard date is 622 and Margaret Barber 623, but we'll forgive them. <laughs> but for the origins of Deuteronomy are older than the reform. The biblical reading and preaching of the law did not begin in 622. Considering the allusions to Shechem, the, to Shechem, the practice must have extended back at least a century into northern Israel. The shock of the discovery of the law in 622 does not mean that such traditions were unknown in Israel previously. It means rather that the Judean monarchy had lost touch with them for as much as 50 to 75 years, assuming that Hezekiah knew of them and used them in his reforms. Was the law specifically written for the purpose of planting it in the temple? We're still quoting Godwell here. Perhaps if we assume that only in this way could its claims be brought to the king convincingly and without danger of the law's advocates. Yet it is striking that even when the, with the written law before him, Josiah was unconvinced until specific reporters and supporters of the law had assured him of its validity. It is more likely that the writing and rewriting of Deuteronomic laws and admonitions was going on underground throughout the reign of Manasseh, 
about 687 to 642. If we visualize the Yavistic calendar, cultic calendar is lapsing, or at least suffering from neglect, the old patterns of cultic renewal and covenant law would be strained and even threatened with extinction. Oral materials remembered from one year to, from year, to year would no longer be recited, and authoritative texts of the laws described at cult sites would become defaced or even destroyed. Thus, both oral and written records of Deuteronomic traditions were driven underground and fostered until they broke to the surface in 622. Here's the last of the quotation from Gottwald. This interpretation does not does away with the view that the plant of Deuteronomy was a pious fraud. No one needed to concoct a book purported to be by Moses. All he had to do was collect materials long attributed to Moses through the device of cult functionary speaking on the behalf of Moses and to assert that these traditions should once again be binding in Israel. Beyond understanding how Deuteronomy might be both new and old at the same time, Gottwald's explanation highlights the idea that there were multiple strands of religious thought in Israel for at least 100 years prior to Lehi. Very clearly, the Deuteronomic reform operated against a previously acceptable tradition. In doing so, it did not invent something new, but elevated an available, if not then dominant, tradition. This multiplicity of traditions within the same culture is absolutely essential to our understanding of the religious climate that produced Lehi and influenced Nephi. As we attempt to understand the multiple lines of thought that were present in Jerusalem on the eve of the Deuteronomic reform, the figure of Asherah becomes an important gauge of both theological change and the time reference for that change. In the Bible, the term Asherah may refer simultaneously to the mother goddess of that name or to her image, such as the one that was removed from the temple. What is the image of the mother goddess Asherah doing in the temple in Jerusalem? She was there because she was the wife or the consort of Yahweh. Several inscriptions have been discovered that specifically speak of Yahweh and his Asherah. Scholars accept this as an indication that Asherah was the consort of Yahweh. Some 70 years before the Deuteronomic reform, King Hezekiah initiated a similar reform that removed Asherah from the temple. Unlike the Deuteronomic reform, that of Hezekiah did not last. In fact, it did not survive until his son. Speaking of Manasseh's reversal of his father's reform, Raphael Patai conjectures, if Manasseh did not bother to replace the brazen serpent, the other image removed from the temple by his father, this was probably due to the fact that with the passage of time, the worship of a deity symbolized or represented by the serpent figure had become obsolete. Not so Asherah, whose motherly figure must have been dear to many worshipers and whose restoration to her traditional place in the temple was therefore considered a religious act of great importance. It is tempting to conjecture that the mythical motivation behind Manasseh's act was the conviction that Yahweh's consort, the great mother goddess Asherah, must be restored to her old and lawful place at the side of her husband. What makes Asherah such a key in understanding the threads of Israelite thought about deity is the discovery of a set of Ugaritic, or Canaanite, texts in 1948. Among these texts is a treasure trove of information about religion in the time period of about 1350 to 1150 BC. See Osael notes, the value of the Ugaritic texts goes beyond the horizons of Canaanite faith. The evidence suggests that Israelite theology was not as radically discontinuous with Canaanite, Canaanite religions as was once previously thought. 